Okay. Um, so, Timmy is going to speak to us. Um, Sitting sitting down. down, yeah, that's something that I actually love to do. <laughs> I've always dreamt of doing it, so hey. <laughs> so let's pray as he brings the word to us this morning. Just stretch out your hand and just pray over him that the Lord will speak to him. Yes, Father, we just want to thank you for your servant this morning. Lord, from the book... You've taught us to listen to you. So, Father, right now we pray that you should speak. Your servant is listening. Pour into him to speak to us. And, Father, open our heart that we might receive from you too. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you, Betty. It's good to see you all. It's good to be back. I must admit, I chuckled to myself a little bit during that second song. It's the breath in our lungs. I was thinking, yeah, I could do with some breath in my lungs, particularly over these last few weeks. Um, but it's good to be back. I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for your prayers, your messages, and your support over the last few weeks. Um, and just bear with me over the coming weeks as I sort of build up my strength and energy once again. I'm going to watch a very short clip. Ohana means family. Family means no one gets left behind or forgotten. Of course, that is from Lilo and Stitch. And it feels very relevant today when we're thinking about Mother and Sunday to give it its full title. Now, the origins of Mother and Sunday come from the church. Traditionally, it would be a day when you would return to your home church or your mother church, meaning the church where you were baptized. So I should probably be in Ilkley this morning. It also has a history, and this is the good news, of being a, a respite in the fasting in preparation for Lent. Oh, oh, sorry, in preparation for Easter during Lent. So all of those of you who've given up something for Lent, enjoy today because you can do whatever it was that you gave up or eat whatever it was that you're giving up. Enjoy it. It's a day historically when domestic servants were given a day off to go to their mother church, usually with family. We know since then it's become much more secularized and commercialized and is now often referred to Mother's Day and celebrates mothers and motherhood. And we know that that brings up a whole range of emotions for so many different people. Those who have lost mothers, those who might not have a good relationship with their mothers, those who are mothers, those who want to be mothers, those who don't know who their mother is, etc. It can be a hard day and we have to remember that it's not just a celebration, but it is also a day where many will mourn. It's an interesting day in the church year though. At the heart of it, whichever angle we take, there is something about family and a celebration of family life together. That's why I shared that little clip. Ohana means family, and that means no one gets left behind or forgotten. Ohana being Hawaiian, probably should have said that at the start. There you go, teaching you some Hawaiian this morning. To me, though, that little clip, when Stitch says those words, that is what the church should be about. The church should be our ohana, our family, when no one gets left behind or forgotten. We are a family, and no one gets left behind. No matter what our experience of family is, our family is in the church family, is the one where we should get all that we need, because we are not united by blood, but by the bond of the Holy Spirit living in each and every one of us. That, of course, doesn't mean everything will be plain sailing and we'll get along all the time. Because as we know, that simply does not happen in real life. There'll be times when we disagree with one another, sometimes on trivial matters, like perhaps should we have ground coffee or instant coffee? Ground coffee for the win every time, by the way. 
through to the much larger disagreements that we have in the church at the moment, for example, LLF. Indeed, the recent General Synod could not even agree to uh, how dis much disagreement there is in the church. That says a lot. They couldn't even agree that we are in, in massive disagreement. The church is divided, whether nationally, diocesan-wide, or locally. We know that. Being in a family, though, means making sacrifices for one another and putting our brothers' and sisters' needs before our own. It's about welcoming people into the family and hoping that no one feels left on the outside. Now, whilst I've been ill, I've struggled to concentrate for too long on reading, playing games, and I stumbled across the reboot of Survivor on the BBC. <laughs> Confession time now. When I was younger, I loved the original that was on ITV in Pula Tiga and Panama. I've now found them on YouTube, and I'm re-watching them, even though I know who wins. If you're not familiar with Survivor, the idea is that there are a number of castaways marooned on a desert island without any contact with the outside world. Initially, they are in tribes and they compete with one another for immunity. Those that don't get immunity go to what's called tribal council, where the tribe votes out one of their own. About halfway through the series, the tribes merge and then it's everyone for themselves, the goal being to win the ultimate prize and the title of sole survivor. Now, that really makes me chuckle every time I hear it, because I keep thinking of Soul Survivor Watford rather than the Soul Survivor. I got through the BBC version surprisingly quickly. I'm not going to tell you how quickly. And then found that Prime Video and other streaming services are available had Australian Survivor a whole 11 seasons. I began watching that, and I'm towards the end of the series. Now, interestingly, on Australian Survivor, the logo at the bottom and their tagline is outwit, outplay, outlast. The tagline for the UK version is trust no one. So why do I share this? Well, what I've noticed and what's come across to me so often while I've been watching it is the way that people play the game. They have to form alliances, work out who they can trust, whether they're in the in crowd or the out crowd. And when the tribe goes to tribal council and they vote one of their own out, the gloves come off. In a recent episode, and I hope I'm not giving any spoilers here for those of you that like Survivor like me, one of the contestants was called by one of his tribe mates a snake. And he got really upset, understandably. That's not a nice thing to say about someone. And in the following episode, you see him weeping with another contestant saying, the last thing is I am a snake. I haven't lied to anyone in this show. I'm just a high school teacher that's been misunderstood. And I thought to myself, well, that's quite convincing. However, in episode two, we saw you lie to the rest of your tribe mates. <laughs> you were given an option to lie or to take the moral high ground. And I became really critical of him and then started going, I want you off the show, I want you off the show because you're not nice. But it got me thinking though, why do I share this? It got me thinking. All I've seen of that individual was a few hours on TV in a surreal environment where he has no contact with the outside world, a group of 20 people he's never met before, and he's simply trying to survive in the game. I was quick to judge. Survival, though, is something that I think we all seek in life in many different ways. Whether it be literal survival if we're facing something terminal, whether it's surviving the week at work, surviving a difficult time in our marriage, surviving a family fallout, surviving a bereavement, it's something that becomes almost second nature to us. And in many ways, that's where our psalm is today. Psalm 34 is about survival. We only had a section of the psalm. Yet, if we were to read the whole thing, we see that this is psalm is one of David's, and it comes when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. In many ways, it can be like a testimony of a person who has gone through terrors. It's a lowly, ordinary, powerless person, not somebody with wealth or position. It's someone who has had to cry to God for help. 
The Hebrew word is similar to the word for God delivering someone. And it's on a par, is this psalm, with the cry of the Israelites, what they made when they were coming out of Egypt. So we are talking of a place where someone has gone through troubles. It's a prayer for someone who is broken on the inside and crushed in spirit. David, on the run from Saul, could illustrate this experience very well. I'm sure we've all been in those situations, friends, where all we can do is cry out to God and hope that he will respond in the only way that he can. It's not always what we want or how we want it, but he will respond. Here in this psalm, we see that it's from a person who has survived. It's not like the Gloria Gaynor song, Gainer song, I will survive, taking all of our human strength to not fall apart. It is about taking the strength, and as, and as John Golding Gay puts it, an Old Testament scholar, it's talking about survival because God answers and rescues. God listens and delivers. God listens and rescues. God is near and God delivers. I'm going to read that again. So it's survival because God answers and rescues. God listens and delivers. God listens and rescues. God is near and delivers. The psalm is not to make us think that we'll survive whatever we're going through based on our own resources, but to believe that we will get through whatever it is because we now believe and know that God will help us to do so. However, there are conditions to be able to do this. We have to turn to God. We can't simply turn to God and plead for rescue. We have to turn to God and turn from the wrongdoing that we have done so that we are walking in his way. Throughout the psalm, it talks about awe of God or fear of God, depending on which translation you use. If we want God to protect us, we need to be the kind of person whose own relationships with other people are in order. You see where this is going. That's back to being Ohana. It's back to being a family with one another where no one is left behind or forgotten. If we need to plead to God for rescue, how are your relationships within your family? How are your relationships within the church? Are they strained at the moment and you feel that at any moment they could break? You're hanging on by a thread. I believe this is a call to the church to wake up and to get our relationships in order. Within the wider church, as I've said, relationships are definitely strained. And I believe that the enemy is trying to pounce on that to disrupt what God is wanting to do in the church in the 21st century. I saw something the other day. The church is not declining. The church is being remade. And I thought, how true is that? that God is working in his church to rebuild. The church feels to be falling apart at the seams, and usually that means something good is around the corner. But right at the moment, it might feel that we are in a fight for survival. I wonder, though, if that's because our relationships have slipped with one another. I once heard a story of a man who'd served in the Second World War. And on returning home, he went to church and he found the services full of spiritual life. And the people were spiritually alive when they were in church. He thought, this is great. This is a wonderful church to be in. As soon as those people left the church, they started gossiping about their neighbors when they got outside. And that meant this individual stopped going to church for many years. Quite striking. I think we're quite good at that in the 21st century of being all spiritual and holy in church, and as soon as we get out, maybe even into the foyer, we start gossiping about one another. Do we always sit with the same people and talk about others in ways that are unhelpful? And this isn't to make you feel guilty. Perhaps if you like to gossip about others, the psalm can serve as a reminder to change our ways so that when the time comes, and the time will come, when we need to plead to God for help and for rescue, we can be someone who will benefit from the promises in the psalm that we've had this morning. Those who benefit are the people who, not, who don't gossip or give false testimony. The people who benefit are those who are more interested in seeking the well-being of others than doing something for themselves. That's countercultural in this world. This world, it's all about me, me, me. 
In the church, it should all be about you, you, you. We put others before ourselves. There are people who are more interested, these are for the people who are more interested in making peace than wronging someone. Who are you? Are you the sort of person that seeks peace with your brothers and sisters, with your ohana? Or are you someone who is really struggling with those relationships at the moment? I want to encourage us to make this church, to make this family our own ohana, where no one gets left behind, where no one gets forgotten, where everybody has a place to be the person God is calling them to be. It might be messy on the way. In fact, it will be messy on the way. But I believe we are all called here for a reason. The Lord has called each and every one of us to Christ Church in this time for a reason. We need to work out what that reason is so that we can walk alongside each other, together, united, aiming for the glory of God and to preach the gospel in this land. Let's be the people that God is calling us to be so that when we cry out, the Lord hears us and will deliver us from our troubles, as it says in verse 17. On this day, Mother in Sunday, when we remember the churches where we were baptized into the faith, when we remember our own mothers or look to our own children, where we celebrate family, let's remember that church is the family of God. Church is our ohana. We're going to listen to a song.